services, how we communicate with the media, how we communicate with our employees. There's been a lot of mention already today about building that culture of security. We're pretty fortunate at Facebook that we already have a hacker mentality um, in terms of our engineering culture, but making security a priority for every single one of our employees is definitely something that continues to be um, a focus um, at our company. And right now, for the month of October, we actually have a month-long initiative um, that we run called Hacktober. Super creative name, I know. Uh, we're in our fifth year of Hacktober, and we run a lot of events and contests and workshops for all of our employees. Um, and it's really great to see a lot of our non-technical, non-engineering employees participate in those events and really take to heart the role that they play in protecting not just Facebook, but the people who use our, our products. So I want to give you guys a little bit of background in terms of how I got here, because I think it's really important that we understand kind of the role that communications is playing in um, security and uh, information security in particular. So I went to college to be a marine biologist. I was hell-bent on becoming a shark scientist. It's what I wanted to do since I was nine years old. Uh, and I was really inspired by Peter Benchley, who's the author um, of the novel Jaws, uh, particularly because he created such a terrible, terrible reputation for these animals. Uh, and when he saw the result of the work that he had created, he had a change of heart. Uh, and he actually became one of the biggest advocates um, for shark conservation work uh, and did a lot of research and spent you know, the remainder of his career actually trying to undo a lot of the things he did uh, with his novel. Uh, and so I've always really wanted to help people understand and kind of dispel hype and uh, get educated on more of the complex and really technical scientific kinds of um, topics and, and better understand the world around them. So it turns out that marine biology, at least from my perspective, did not have a lot of really awesome career opportunities. There's only like three jobs at Shark Week. Uh, so I ended up going to uh, grad school and completing my uh, master's in corporate public relations and started helping companies in the area of climate change and environmental science and corporate social responsibility and sustainability. And again, another very technical, complex issue that a lot of people have a hard time wrapping their head around. Uh, we're still having debates about this, which to me is just, it's really <laughs> embarrassing, honestly. Um, and then about six or seven years ago, I started connecting with a lot of security professionals. Um, I actually started my security experience working with the chief security office at AT&T um, and spent many years working with them. And then recently uh, joined the team at Facebook to help them specifically communicate uh, with a consumer base and a media environment and with our employees uh, about what security really means. I think what we're really lacking in the industry right now is just basic uh, baseline literacy among most end users and consumers. Uh, when I left, I'm gonna say my hotel, but when I leave my apartment every morning, I lock the front door, right? Like, we don't have that online yet in terms of it really being embedded in our culture and our society. And I think that makes it really difficult for us to have honest and accurate conversations um, as security professionals with people outside of that community. Um, and I'm actually going to violently disagree with the notion that end users can't be educated to make safer decisions. I absolutely think that that is something that we can do, and I think it's something that we should uh, take responsibility for. So why am I here specifically today? I see a lot of really concerning behavior and communications coming from the security community out to the rest of the world. And look, like, we all make mistakes. I realize that not everybody has experience in communications or public relations, just like I honestly have no idea how to hash your passwords. So I think there's an opportunity for us to work together to help improve the reputation of security overall. And this particular comment, uh, I say this uh, to my team actually a lot, um, because there's nothing wrong with being caught with your fly down, it happens to everybody. Uh, but 
what makes it weird is when other people start to notice, and yet you're still not doing anything about it, right? So it gets a little bit awkward that we, we've come into this position where now we're in the spotlight, we're having to really grow up and mature as an industry in the way that we communicate who we are and what we do. And the longer we continue to do this really poorly, the rest of the world kind of looks at us like, at what point are, are we going to figure this out? And so I know that as an industry, and this is, I think, like the 27th slide you're seeing this morning with like data breach headlines. Uh, but these are the things that most companies and most uh, <coughs> boardrooms and things that they're focused on. When they think about reputation and security, this is what they're thinking of, right? They don't want to be the next headline. Yet, how many times do we hear that breaches are inevitable? A compromise is going to happen in some way, shape, or form to somebody, probably all of us, at some point. And in fact, people have gotten so concerned about their reputation and becoming the next headline uh, that it's actually starting to become a very, very concerning priority um, for a lot of security teams and a lot of business executives. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Index of Cyber Cybersecurity. It's a monthly survey that's run by uh, Dan Beer and a bunch of uh, his cohorts. And they survey about a thousand security professionals every month and just kind of take a temperature read of what is the security industry concerned about right now. And for the last couple of months, the number one concern has been media and public perception. That's above nation state attacks and weaponized threats. Now, to me, as a communications professional, I think that's absolutely insane and also terrifying that we're more concerned about what people think of us than actually doing security, right? So there are a lot of people in the industry who have recently stepped forward on Twitter and conferences uh, and other venues to provide uh, advice on how to work with media, how to do interviews, I think that is amazing. I would really uh, recommend that you guys not undervalue that contribution and that advice, because uh, these people are doing it simply because they care about the community and those of you here in the room, right? So when somebody is saying, maybe it's not a great idea to do that media interview, please take that to heart. Uh, and in fact, I would propose that these headlines are actually far more concerning uh, and damaging to our industry than the data breaches. They are overhyped. They are incredibly um, negative towards security professionals in particular. And the sad, sad worst part about all of these headlines is they were completely avoidable. Every single one of these stories was pitched by a PR person or a security researcher or somebody in our community. These were stories that we made up about ourselves, right? And is this really the way that we want people to think about who we are and security as a whole? <coughs> so where do we start? If we're actually going to address this problem of the way that we present ourselves to the rest of the world, where do we begin? And the reality is, is reputation management uh, at its core is really an exercise in reverse engineering. So I'm hoping that that is a comfortable enough buzzword for the people here that we can go through a little bit of an exercise together. So how do we want the world to complete this sentence, right? What do we want people to think uh, that info cyber or security means? So I'm actually gonna ask you to use your brains for a couple of seconds, and I'm really sorry that I'm that speaker that's asking for our engagement. Uh, <laughs> but can you guys throw out like just a couple of ideas, like how do we complete this sentence? What do we want? Or how do we want people to complete this sentence when they think about our community? Not cyber. Not cyber? <laughs> boring. You want them to think it's boring? Okay. Any others? Secure. Okay. <laughs> frustrating. Necessary, frustrating. Possible. Possible. Evolving. Evolving. I actually really like that one. I, I gave this talk uh, a couple days ago and uh, somebody suggested that it's a journey. So I like evolving. I'm going to go with that um, because I like it. Um, Process.
So I'm going to take you guys through a couple of just like thought exercises and see if maybe I can convince you to think about security communications in a little bit of a different way. So I, I work with a very, very brilliant colleague uh, at Facebook named uh, Beth Dean. She's one of our product designers. She recently published uh, a post on Medium about emotional intelligence in design. Now I realize that we're not designers here, but her subtitle is How Design Grows Up. And so I'm going to talk about how security grows up within the context of how would we build that reputation if our end goal is for people to think that security is an evolving, more kind of journey um, process. And so there are five values or principles that I'm going to uh, walk through and, and outline for you guys. Self-awareness, self-discipline, motivation, empathy, and people skills. And these are uh, also the, the values that, that Beth puts in her, her post about uh, product design and emotional intelligence. And I want you guys to just keep in mind that we are not the only tech or um, kind of like science-related field that is in the process of learning how to grow up and how to communicate um, as adults. So there's a lot of things that we can learn from other industries and other fields. Uh, I actually think that's probably the number one thing that we could do right now to impact immediate uh, and meaningful change is to stop being so insular in the way that we think about uh, solving security challenges. Now before I get into all of the details of those five principles, I want to call out something that's pretty universal, just about human communication in general. And how do we get people to connect to an issue? Um, and so you'll notice on the right side, this is uh, like the technical audience, right? Um, and notice how big that audience size is, right? When you talk technical, that's how many people are likely going to connect to what you're saying. It is really going to resonate with like seven and a half people. Um, and as we, if we want to grow the audience size, we actually just have to accept that people are naturally going to connect to our issue on an emotional level because they simply don't have the technical experience. Now, the government is really, really good at this. Politicians are really, really good at this, right? Because their livelihood is based on getting people to connect to their issues. Um, and unfortunately, the emotion that they tend to use the most is fear. It's also an emotion that comes from a lot of security vendors, and it drives me fucking crazy, right? Because fear is only motivating to a certain point, and then it becomes debilitating, and people feel overwhelmed and hopeless. Um, and so if we really want to build, like I said, that literacy among consumers and regulators and non-technical audiences, we have to learn how to communicate about security without relying on that fear-mongering tendency. That is absolutely harder than using fear. It means your PR people and your marketing people have to get smarter and better at their jobs. And I'm fully aware of that. I know they all hate me right now, but we cannot have conversations about minimizing uh, this surveillance behavior of our governments when we're freaking everybody out. That's why those programs exist because we have sufficiently scared the shit out of everybody, right? So how do we have productive conversations in those areas with our politicians and regulators when at the same time we're being so incredibly irresponsible and lazy in our communications with other stakeholders and the best we can come up with is fear? I, like I said, I think that's incredibly irresponsible. And I think it's time for, for those of us who do communications within the security industry to, you know, put on our big girl pants and, and do it better. So uh, I'm going to quickly run through these five things. Again, keeping in mind, this is a journey. It's always evolving. Um, so when we think about self-awareness, the thing that's really difficult about knowing yourself and being really honest about that is that it includes not just how you feel about yourself, but how others feel about you. And I think we are really not great at being honest about how others feel about us. A really good way to 
uh, judge whether or not we're effectively communicating our message, which in this point would be InfoSec is always evolving, right? There is no end point to this. We're never gonna get to the point where we can go check the box, yes, we're done with security. We've, we finally made it, right? We do have to get people a little bit more comfortable with the fact that this is always going to happen. This is something that just now has to become a normal part of our mindset and of our lives. And so, a really, really easy test to see if you're hitting the mark on your messaging is to look at, you know, say that New York Times article that your CEO is really excited about because you got one quote in a story about somebody else. Uh, compare that to the way that your target audience responds to that story on social media. So I've actually seen a lot of companies like pat themselves on the back because they got a really great news article and then you look at their target market where they actually want to sell those products and people are like openly mocking them on Twitter and just laughing at the fact that you know they've been quoted saying something completely ridiculous. Um, and so the media coverage and that news story, I would suggest, is probably not the goal. It is a means to an end. And if you're getting lots of really great media coverage and yet the security community still thinks you're a joke, probably need to tweak the way that you're communicating. So if we're thinking about security as a journey or as an evolving process, um, really look to see if that is coming through in both um, your communications, like what you're pushing out, as well as the way that people are receiving it and reacting to it. Self-discipline is really around the idea of it's, it's just better to do it right the first time than have to explain why you did it wrong. Right, I think one of the easiest places to see this in uh, security right now is with um, the responsible disclosure issue, right? And the way that we work with external researchers. It's not great to see so many companies have to backpedal in their communications because they had a knee-jerk reaction to one particular event. And so we need to be better at self-disciplining ourselves both uh, from a security perspective, but also from a communications perspective, uh, so that there's less uh, demand for somebody else, say a government entity, to swoop in and regulate us because it looks like we can't do it for ourselves. Now people can smell your motivation from a mile away. Like, I swear to God, if, if I have to read another malware report from an AV company, I'm kind of going to lose my shit. I know you're going to tell me that malware is getting worse because you're also going to try to sell me the solution to that, you know, overhyped, non-existent, somewhat imagined problem. Uh, and people can tell that. Like, we're not stupid, right? And so it looks really horrible. Um, and by the way, reporters and journalists have, have figured this out too, right? When you're pitching press release after press release with these really shallow superficial reports that we all pretend is actually research, um, it's damaging the reputation of our community, right? Reporters are becoming numb to this, consumers are becoming numb to this, uh, and it's not great for the reputation of security as a whole. If this is a journey, and this is always evolving, we need to get to the next phase in terms of how do we actually communicate the real threats the severity of the issues to people who don't necessarily intuitively jump to the correct answer, right? And again, this is part of that responsibility that we need to accept as a community that it's not okay to freak people out just to sell something. I know that that's really difficult for people to understand, but there is a way to sell security so that people will feel empowered, so that they will feel safe, and so that they feel like they have a voice to go to their government and to their elected officials and ask for something that is logical, practical, and actually real. Now, empathy is all about being able to experience and understand the struggles and the feelings of somebody else. I think this is an area, if we did nothing else, in our security communications, this is the one thing I would love to see change the most. We communicate as if we, it's just gonna be you and me, right? Nobody else matters. Um, we're not really talking to our own anymore. 
Uh, I was actually, uh, Elisa mentioned I, I work on, on PR for DEF CON, and unfortunately that means that I spent most of the conference uh, in the press room helping people figure out, you know, Ethernet cables. Um, and we had Dan Kaminsky and Jeff Moss that was going to go up on the website. And so they were having this conversation in front of a camera, uh, which of course meant that I was going to listen and eavesdrop and, you know, learn all kinds of brilliant things. Uh, and one of the things that Dan said that I thought was really interesting, and, and it's, I, I've been kind of dwelling on it for the last couple of months, is that everybody's in the room now. It's not about us. They were talking about how security had moved from this kind of niche subculture into a driving force of society and, and a piece of kind of the next evolution of our, our culture um, as, as humans. And you know, when Dan was like, everybody's in the room now, that really struck me because that doesn't just mean that what we're doing has implications for everybody. It certainly does. But it also means that everybody is watching what we're doing. The way that we communicate with each other, within our own security community, people can see that. I think like the worst thing that's ever happened was security people joining Twitter. But <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like people can see that it's public, right? This it absolutely impacts our reputation. Um, I think it's somewhat deplorable that our number one quoted security expert is a celebrity parody account. Um, but, but that's what we've allowed to happen, right? And as long as we allow it to happen, it will continue to be. Uh, and then I'm going to put people skills up here. And this is, I promise, this is not a condescending um, jab uh, at engineers. Um, this is really, I want you guys to think about it again. I talked about some of the, um, the non-technical areas uh, that we need to embrace and, and stop being so insular. There are a lot of people within your organizations or within the broader technology or business community who can bring these types of things to the table for us. So like I mentioned, I, I'm not a technical person. I am not an engineer, but I care about security. I care about people. I care about our community. And so the more that I can pull kind of those more uh, like people-driven skill sets and talents onto our team, just makes us better. I do not expect that every single engineer on my team is going to become the most empathetic, people-focused communicator in the world. So I'm going to go hire that person to help the engineers. We can team up and do it together. So think about whether it's your, your PR team, your marketing team, yes, your legal team. These are all skills that, that security desperately needs. Uh, and so I would encourage you guys um, one of the things that uh, our new CSO, Alex Damos, always says is that he does not want our security team to be the jerks in the company. People need to want to come to us. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we do uh, Hacktober. We need to be friends with everybody in our company because we need them to come tell us um, when something is happening so that we have that visibility um, and so that they will come ask us for questions rather than try to find a workaround. Um, so I'm actually going to wrap up with that. Um, I've used up all the time, and I'm really sorry. So if you have questions, please come find me. Uh, I will be here for the rest of the day. But thank you so much uh, for listening. <laughs>